I think I hate the way that Carrie Maniscalco tells stories. Hello, welcome or welcome back to Spellbound. I'm Beach, and I read a ton of great books in January and I want to talk about them, but this video is all about the fantasy. So to start us off, we have A Forgery of Roses, and this is by Jessica S. Olson and was published in 2022 by Inkyard Press, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. This YA fantasy is a super cool genre blend of like a gothic, a really creepy gothic aesthetic with somewhat of a murder mystery whodunit kind of vibe, and it was so much fun. <laughs> So in this book, Myra is an artist and in this world, painting can be like magical. The magic powers that you can possess are only with regard to art and they're passed down from the artist who is like God in this world. Also in this world, possessing those sort of magical art powers is kind of illegal. And in this very Victorian London inspired city, uh, the governor himself is definitely on a witch hunt against all artists. And the way that this magic system works, it's not just that they're really good at art, which they are like good at art. So like say you have a cut on your arm. If an artist with the gift paints a portrait of you, they can paint away the cut and that will like heal you up IRL. Cool magic system um, and that's like super uniquely tied to art. But one day our girl Myra finds herself being commissioned by none other than the governor's wife to paint a portrait of her son, the governor's son. She has four days to complete this portrait and she, while she is working on it she has to live in like the cellar <laughs> of the governor and governor's wife creepy gothic mansion and she's to tell no one because actually the governor's son is dead but nobody knows that and she doesn't want to tell anybody she just wants to bring him back to life and she is blackmailing Myra to paint this portrait and reanimate him and bring him back to life. Uh, which is a tall order for any artist, but especially one as young and as untrained as Myra. But in order for Myra to heal him in the painting, in the process of reanimating him, she has to know how he died, which is kind of where the whodunit murder mystery part comes in. So Myra teams up with the governor's other son, the one who has chronic anxiety and is kind of relegated to the shadows in this, again, very creepy gothic mansion. And together they have to figure out who killed him, how, and why in order for her to complete this portrait. I give this one four and a half stars. Honestly, the genre blend was super cool and it was so well done in my opinion. It was both all of the best elements of a whodunit and all the best elements of a gothic creepy tale, you know? Like the aesthetic was so fantastically gothic and creepy and that sort of like foggy London streets kind of vibe and the mansion was perfection. There was even one part where the two main characters stumble into like the forbidden room of the of the mansion, you know, and they find these absolutely grotesque portraits of other people in the mansion with like horrible disfigurements as if someone was trying to use the artist's gifts like in reverse and cause harm. It was horrifying and fantastic. It really gave off a sort of Dorian Gray, Jekyll and Hyde kind of vibe and I loved it all while they're trying to solve like a very simple kind of mystery. I thought it was super fun. So it also had some good representations. So it had good chronic illness rep, which I did not know going in. I was very surprised by that and it made me like tear up while reading it. I thought it was done really, really well. Um, and it had chronic anxiety rep, which I thought was okay. Now again, the strength of this book comes from the aesthetic, the vibes, the atmosphere, right? And the plot I think is fun, it's interesting, it has some really good surprises throughout and I think that it unfolds at just the right pace. It's not too slow, it's not too fast. I really liked how the story was told and everything that I got to look at on the way. Uh, what I didn't love about this book were the characters, to be honest. I didn't find them as compelling as I wanted to. But specifically, I didn't love the character's intersection with the anxiety rep. So specifically, the character with anxiety has more than one very long monologue where he pops off talking about how his chronic anxiety is justification for consistently throughout the book making bad and cowardly choices that in some instances actually have very steep consequences 
for the surrounding characters. So I didn't love that, but I still recommend this book for a good example of a genre blend. So gothic atmosphere with a classic murder mystery whodunit and a splash of necromancy, hell yeah. Throne of the Fallen by Carrie Maniscalco, published 2023 by Little Brown and Company. So I think that I hate the way that Carrie Maniscalco tells stories. This book is an adult standalone continuation of the Kingdom of the Wicked series, which is an absolute mess of a series. Um, but this book has been getting some like decent reviews, whereas like, nobody talked about the Kingdom of the Wicked series, and I get it. Like, what was that? People have been kind of enjoying this, so I thought that, hey, maybe within the boundaries of a standalone, Carrie Maniscalco would be able to tell a story that makes sense with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, but that was dumb of me. Like, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me through a sequel conclusion and a separate 600 page standalone. Like, I'm the idiot, <laughs> for sure. So this book follows some girl, I don't remember her name and I'm not looking it up, but she gets swept away in this very long and intense competition with Envy, who's a prince of hell. Okay, so I've mentioned a few times that I do not care for the Kingdom of the Wicked series, specifically how Maniscalco just like piles on lore on lore on lore on mythology on lore um, and just keeps like <laughs> replacing her own big baddies with bigger baddies until she just loses the plot. <laughs> and it's kind of like Once Upon a Time. Now, no hate because I love this show, but also some hate because this show was objectively bad. But what the show did is like the first two seasons, it was a normal television show and you have your bad guy who's like a woman and she's the villain through like the first two seasons until, whoa, plot twist, you find out that there's actually been a even bigger baddie kind of behind the scenes pulling, pulling puppet strings and making turning this person into a villain on purpose. And so that's kind of like a fun reveal. It's like, okay, well they were manipulated to be it and there was a one baddie all along. But then that like that story finished. So it was like they didn't uh, know what to do or like to move forward. So they just had to from scratch create an even bigger baddie. And the more that they did this and they did this every single season, they just kept reintroducing new villains. They weren't just separate villains to make it sort of episodic or Scooby-Doo. It, it had to be bigger and bigger and bigger villains, which ultimately only succeeds in like negating the scope of the original first few seasons, making the whole thing that you were invested in feel stupid. And it feels so small and insignificant. It's like, then why did we go through this? That's what Carrie Miniscal does to her own lore in the middle of a book. It took years to turn that already, already very, very poorly scripted and poorly acted show into the train wreck that it was. Um, Carrie Maniscalco, man, she can pull it off in this single book in 600 pages. She can actually retcon her own shit. Impressive, but also awful. So like this book, two thirds of it, it takes place in hell. Okay, so... <laughs> For example, you've got the seven princes of hell named after the seven deadly sins, but you've also got gods and goddesses. And I want to say titans are in there too, but maybe they weren't. But you also have the old crone and the old crone is somehow more powerful than all of them, uh, but she's barely in the story. But also you have vampires and I think werewolves too, but they're off screen. But somehow in all of this, the big baddie, the big, big bad guy of hell is a fairy. Specifically, the king of the unseelie court, because fucking obviously you gotta have the seelie and unseelie for no reason. And it's like, <laughs> babes, <laughs> babes, we're in hell. Literally, we're in hell. You didn't have to do all this. You had plenty of literary play doh with just hellish iconography. Well, we didn't, we didn't need all this mess. But honestly, that's not even my main beef. Um, so Carrie Maniscalco really enjoys pulling one over on her readers. Uh, I don't know why, but she does it a lot. She always has like a stupid main character who doesn't know anything and everyone around her always knows more than she does. It's a sort of fish out of water thing and whatever, it does help us understand the world a little bit more that we're seeing it through her eyes. But what Maniscalco likes to do is pull this like third act twist right before the climax that reveals that actually our main character isn't a stumbling fawn in the woods just being born. She is actually integral to the entire plot and is somehow more powerful than everyone around her and in fact knew it all along and knew what she was doing. Which is not as fun of a surprise as I think Maniscalco thinks it is. Like that's not fun for us as readers. That's not a side character who like turns out to be this like powerful being. It's our main character. 
some we and we were in her head so like <laughs> so all the time that she was like in peril and scared and confused all the times that she was confused she actually wasn't what was that did you lie like it's not a fun discovery it just makes our 600 page emotional investment in this character and her journey feel fraudulent she was never confused she was never really a fish out of water she was just fish in water but in a fucking skin suit so i gave it three stars and i'm so happy for those who enjoyed it gods of jade and shadow this is by Sylvia Moreno Garcia, published in 2019 by Delray Books, an imprint of Random House. This book takes place in the Roaring Twenties and it follows Cassiopeia when she accidentally unlocks a chest in her grandfather's room and it unleashes a god of the underworld who had been imprisoned in the chest by his brother a very long time ago. So the two of them set out on an adventure um, to take revenge on the other god of the underworld and their adventure is through Mexico and the southwest of the United States and it ends in California. It's full of Mayan mythology and fables and folklore woven throughout and some really cool run-ins with gods as characters. I gave it five stars, but it wasn't my favorite of Moreno Garcia's books. So this book is very mythology forward, and while there was a glossary in the back of the book which helped, a lot of this folklore was unfamiliar to me, a, a white woman from the American South. So that's not the book's responsibility, that's on me. But I think there were times when this narrative wove in the fables and the mythology into the story in such a way that A, kind of told the story of the mythology, and B, helped express or underscore a character's current emotional state, which helped us ground in the present of the story. But other times it did get a bit info dumpy where the god of the underworld is kind of describing a character or a god that they're about to meet or interact with. When that happened multiple times, I found that a little bit confusing. So I don't think that the book is wrong for having as much mythology as it does. And I don't think that it's the book's like fault that I don't know what any of it is. But I do think that there were times when it was incorporated really well into the story. And then I do think there were other times where it just got info dumpy and was it kind of jarring and took us out of the present moment. That kind of explained why every day at this time there's a squirrel. His name is Crook and he comes down the starfruit tree right beside the window and just picks a fight with my cat Fable. Um, so that's what she's bickering at the window with Crook. So I think it may have helped if our main character had been a little bit more involved or familiar with Mayan mythology or folklore so that we could have seen or learned more through her eyes how she felt about this mythology or specifically how she felt about these Mayan mythological characters that she's interacting with. But actually she's Catholic or culturally Catholic so all of this sort of Mayan folklore is, is pretty new to her. So she's just kind of mirroring how the questions that we have. So in this way, the book unfolds a lot like a fairy tale. And I really enjoyed that. I think it was the best way to tell this story. But in doing so, it does create a bit of distance between us and our characters. And again, I like that. It served the story really well. So all that. <laughs> but then we enter act three and we're going into the labyrinth. So not literally, but a the story term. So in act three, when, when you're entering the final battle with your big baddie, the arena in which that battle takes place, that's called the labyrinth. So in this book, the labyrinth is navigating the roads of Shibalba or the underworld. And this entire section of the book was absolutely brilliant. So in this section, we the tone does kind of shift and we are able to get to know Kashapia in more of an intimate way as she reflects on their journey overall as well as the present moment now. And it's really well written and the ending is spectacular in bittersweet and the most beautiful way. The last third honestly to me made the entire pace of the book, which is a little slower because of the way that it's told. The last third of the book made all of that worth it and more. And finally, I loved the relationship between our main character and the god of the underworld. Like, you want to talk about a slow burn villain love interest? Perfection. But not only that, their relationship was so romantic. And I mean that in the truest, in the truest form of the word. It was romance. 
they their interactions their as they got to know each other it was romantic. I loved this book. It is gorgeous, a gorgeous, gorgeous book, and I highly recommend it. But I do think that you should know how the story is going to unfold before you begin, because if you're expecting a contemporary YA romanticy, you're gonna be disappointed. It doesn't read that way. Expect a fairy tale and you'll get one. So thanks so much for sticking around. Have you read any of these three fantasy books? And if you have, what did you think? And if you made it to the end of this video, leave a rose emoji in honor of some classic gothic iconography. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you loved it, hit subscribe. And as always, happy reading.